Hello, beautiful, and welcome to another episode of The Gifted Table. This is your host, Dr. Melanie Harris. And let me tell you, fam, I'm so excited today because we have been focusing on women in leadership because, you know, that's our get down, what gifts we're bringing to the table. But today we are going to start the first of many of which I hope to come of talking to some inspiring, educated, all about it, leading men. And they're going to step into the mail room. So today, our first episode of the mail room is going to feature the one. The only, he's real, Dr. Anthony Rice, District Administrator. And Anthony, welcome to The Gift the Table. All righty. Thank you for having me, Dr. Melanie Harris. I appreciate you having me. And I'm, I'm glad I'm the first one to ever be on your show. I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. So I'm ready to get it started. So I got a lot to talk about. And so let's get this going. Oh, you oh, oh so see how he comes prepared. He, <laughs> let me pull my seat up close to the table because he, he has come, he is sitting close to the table to bring his gifts. So I know you, sir. We've worked together. We are former colleagues. You have always been just a dynamic leader and a man of inspiration, not only for men and young boys who really need an education, but also for women. So for those who do not know you, tell us a little bit about. You, what you're doing in education and how long you've been in education. I've been in education for about 24 years. Um, as of right now, I am the coordinator of special education for Marina Valley Unified School District. Uh, I've been doing that for approximately about a year and a half now. Prior to that, um, I was a, you know, a site administrator. I was a you know, at the high school prior to coming to Marino Valley, I was a principal at the alt ed. And so I had a different, you know, a different journey than everyone else. It's kind of, you know, not a different, a difficult journey. Um, because a lot of times, especially for men, um, you know, we're placed in roles where we're doing a lot of discipline, right? So when I first got into administration, a lot of times, um, the roles that I was, um, you know, that I had were either the dean of discipline, you know, you're the gatekeeper of making sure that suspensions and things are, are low. And, and so I just kind of got tired of that because a lot of the the students that I were seeing were young black boys. And so for me, it was important for me to make decisions so mm -hmm. that I was able to provide resources instead of um, always being told how they want things done. So I put myself in a position to, um, you know, be a principal at all ed. I was a principal uh, for three years um, in uh, a neighboring district until I got to Marino Valley. And then once I got to Marino Valley, I kind of just you know, kind of spread my wings and figure out how what I want to do next. You know, it's a district where you can do that. So I was very pleased with, um, you know, with my career and where I'm going. I'm still trying to rise my way to the top, but I've been doing this for a while. And, you know, I appreciate the work that I'm doing. And, um, you know, I'm just I'm just I'm grateful for the the work that I'm able to do and to work with some of the great people like yourself. And I'm sad for you to leave, leave us. But, you know, I had a great time working with you like you, you know, you Likewise, empower so many, <laughs> you, you empower so many people. Um, you know, just, you know, the first time we met, I just felt that, you know, just that there was an energy there, you know what I mean? In terms of how, what in your passion, we have the same passion in terms yeah. of how we just want to help, you know, people of color and just kind of move forward, how we can help them navigate through this system, because it's not as easy as it looks sometimes, right. you know what I mean? And we we deal with some difficult things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we got to be very resilient in terms of how we are, um, you know, how we educate, you know what I mean? Because a lot of times people have their perception of how they feel we should do things. So, you know, I started off as a, um, as a, as a PE teacher. You Get know, out of town. To, yeah. Be the PE teacher. So it was weird because I've started off as a PE teacher. Mm -hmm. And when I started, when I wanted to, you know, kind of move into administration, you know, I had about a lot of barriers because I was a football coach mm. and, you know, I was a track coach. I was a softball coach. Did and you feel like time, you were like kind of typecast at that point? Yeah. I, you know, there's a stereotype there, you know, there's mm -hmm. a stereotype there. So, you know, as I started taking my administrative classes, you know, you know, you don't see a lot of um, African-American males in, in leadership at all. So my thing was, I wanted to, you know, I always try to be the, the unicorn to try to do something that no one else tries to do. When you get into administration, it's all about coaching. You know what I mean? And I think 
that was something that I was very successful in is mm-hmm. being a coach and being able to coach. Um, you know, I was a football coach for several years, mm-hmm. uh, you know, track coach for several years, softball coach for several years. But I was very successful doing that because I was able to, you know, kind of maneuver students to where they needed to be, whether it, whether it be academically or whether it be acad- athletically. What are the skill sets that a coach brings to leading that someone who probably doesn't have that background, that it looks just a little bit differently. How, how, how would you kind of make those, that difference of leading when you've been a coach versus just someone who's just kind of come up the ranks in different teaching styles? So for me, it's just basically knowing how to structure things, right? You got to know the people that you're dealing with. Good coaches know exactly that niche to find, to get that person to go exactly where he wants to go. Right. And some coaches are go in and they have their own mindset of like, you know, it's either my way or the highway. Right. But I wasn't a coach like that. So my coach, my coaching style was I would listen to my players and I would say, Hey, so what do you like, what do you think that, what, what do you think you need to do better? Right. And so I would listen to them. And so as I'm listening to them, I would kind of navigate them through that. So a lot of people, when they get into coaching, it's more so that they think that they're the dictator. Right. I'm just going to dictate to you how this is going to go. You need to provide that sense of how can I get this person to to the, to here to the next level, to the next level. Right. Coach people up. Yeah. Coach them up. How do you get them to the next level? As I got into administration, you know, when I deal with, say, you know, when I deal with my peers or when I deal with, you know, people that are under me, I, I try to at least giving them a perspective so that they can see things from a different lens. Cause a lot of people see things through their own lens. And if you can give them an opportunity to see things from a different lens, then you're coaching that person, right? So you're actually coaching them when they don't even know that you're, you're coaching them. You know, I was a professional athlete too. So, I mean, I grew up uh, playing sports all my life. And so, but I was always coachable. I would observe coaches, Mm -hmm. right. And I would watch them and how they interact with players Mm -hmm. because there were some players. I'm like, man, that dude, that guy's not going to get it. But obviously then you'll see how the coach kind of gets him to understand, to get that person to the next level, especially when you were playing at the professional level, because at the professional level, you have to be on point or you going to. Your background in coaching. I mean, this is so significant. I kind of want to want to sit in this a little while Okay, because coaching as a leader can be so impactful. And for those who have never been in those roles or who never played a sport and was coached effectively themselves, it's a different type of leadership. So uh, tell me about how some of your coaching strategies have been successful for you as a leader and where they may have fallen a little short and you had to kind of pivot to do something okay. a little differently. You know, I was able to come in as a as a young coach at a high school when I was um in a dish in a in a particular district where um I came in, they were I, I want to say this team probably only in the la- that last two years they probably only won won like six games. And so I came in, but I had a plan. You know, I had a plan and I knew exactly what I needed to do to get these young men to buy into what I needed for what I needed them to do to be successful. I mentored them as I coached them, right? So I did a lot of mentoring and I did a lot and I did a lot of reflecting. As a coach, you know, you're dealing with a young, young a bunch of young men that are making a lot of decisions and sometimes they make adult decisions. Mm-hmm. And so when they're making these decisions, they don't really have that male influence to give them the guidance that they need so that they're able to be successful and move forward as men, right? Because a lot of times we don't have that. And so I went into this thinking that, okay, you know, just think back to some of the things that you had to deal with, or you done as a young, as a young man, and how can you guide them and give them that information so that they're able to kind of process it and kind of move forward. And I just give them that information. I always reflect back to some of the things I did, even as an administrator, right? I'll talk about some of the things I could have did. I, I did, I did, correctly and some of the things I could have done better, right? As an administrator, because we don't really, they don't give us, I mean, they don't give us a guide to how to be an administrator. There's no playbook for that, Mm -hmm. sir. They they don't give us a guide on how to navigate as a black administrator. Hmm. And I think a lot of times, because I don't care what anybody say, there are two different expectations. 
mm-hmm. for for somebody that uh, that is non-color, there's somebody that is color. Mm-hmm. And especially for male and female, we have we have it rough because our our rope is like that that small. Yeah. Right. Our rope is small. So when we go in, we either do things the way they want us to do it. We and we don't have the autonomy to say, OK, well, I'm going to do it my way. Why do you, you think that I mean? is? Why do I, when, I, when you're placed in a leadership position? Yeah. But whether your experience or someone else's, yeah. someone that you may know, you're placed in a leadership position, whatever that position may be. You are ready to start your vision, you know, set on a path to lead your team, lead your organization, yeah. lead your department, whatever it may be. But yeah. then yet you feel like I don't have the autonomy to do so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that they have full confidence in our ability sometimes. And I think they they put us in these positions thinking that they have full confidence in their ability, in our abilities. But a lot of times, um, you know, you make a mistake that mistake could be detrimental to your career, right? And, and there's some times where you don't even make a mistake. And it's almost like the judicial system sometimes, mm-hmm. right? You look at the judicial system for, you know, just African-Americans. I mean, it's unfair. We all know that. And a lot of times we have to just, you know, just reap the re- repercussions of it. And hopefully we can get ourselves out of it and get ourselves back into a place to where we can kind of start over again. So let me ask you this, sir. I want to kind of swivel back a little bit okay. to how men and women lead okay. and those types of things. So who has been the most influential leader, mentor to you in your career right now? I was always, I would always go to CASA, right? I'm always at CASA and, you know, you, I've never been around. Um, I want to say when I first started administration, when I started going to CASA, I've never seen a bunch of um, African-American leaders in one, one space. But the one, the person that was, was facilitating it at the time was Dr. Judy White. Mm. And I remember um, just the impact that she had on people, right? And just watching her and just watching how just just flawless and how she just, people just kind of just, it, it, it was almost watching like, I, I, I would hate to say Mother Teresa, but it, something similar to that to that nature to but just how how she just just flawless and how she just navigated the, the system and how she, how she worked with people just amazing just amazing work and just and how she just uh, and a, and a, and a god-fearing woman right and a god-fearing woman and everything that she does is based on her spiritual beliefs probably my number one in terms of that influential female that I've had in, in education that I've had an opportunity to encounter in terms of education. So she has to be that person. And, and I know that she would truly appreciate um, hearing you say that, sir. Yeah. She does tune in to the gifted table. Thank you. Dr. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure she'll be very pleased to say that. Yeah. And, and when we think about, you know, men and women, because for me, it was important for me to start having that that male contact on here um, and talking to some leading men about what's going on. Um, But, but as leaders, you know, gender wise, sometimes there are some disparities in how we lead and there's some equity gaps there. Mm -hmm. What would you say is some of the uh, differences between how you've observed women leaders lead and how you observe men leaders lead and even okay. you include yourself in that in that yeah. answer as well i would say the difference that i see within women leading is that women when it comes to dealing with their own race they in terms of having a man's back oh my god it is absolutely it, they 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 rolling with a man, an african american man regardless of what that looks like mm-hmm. unfortunately all right. And this is just it, sometimes I see I think that we need to do a better job of making sure that we uphold our women where they need to be from a man's perspective and looking at that. And I think from a male to male, I don't think we do a, a, a good job of supporting each other from a men to men standpoint. A lot of times you'll see um, a lot of men and a lot of men that are already in positions mm-hmm. where they're not really trying to put a lot of black men in, in place and they could. But they're not trying to do that because I don't know if the feedback they might get is like if you you just hiring way too many. As a black man looking at other African American men that are in the you know similar roles that I and even higher roles that I see, I don't see them being intentional on making sure that we're uplifting each other so that we can all be in the same space. 
You know what I mean? And a lot of time that's unfortunate because we need that. You know what I mean? Sometimes we don't have that opportunity to um, get that mentorship a lot by the people that are already doing the work. And I think that that was a lot of, that was part of um, Dr. Harris. That was part of my dissertation was um, the um, underrepresentation of African-American men in principal roles and district leadership roles. Um, And it was, the the data was astonishing to see. It wasn't regional? Um, the no, I, 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 between I, I, regions and the nation. Yeah, I went state. Um, I went state and I went counties. Mm-hmm. And from a state level, I think we were only, um, I want to say 2% um, from a state level of district administrators and uh, principals, 2%. And I think from when we came to the county level, when we came to, I would say, Riverside County and some of the other counties, it was very, it was pretty similar to that. You know what I mean? And like, if you look at our district and um, the district that I'm in now, um, in terms of uh, females, I mean, there's, you know, it's a high percentage when you come to males, it's still kind of a low percentage, but at the end of the day, um, from a state, from a statewide, it's still kind of low, you know what I mean? But how do you get us there, right? So, and, you know, because people will say, well, there aren't a lot of Black a lot of Black teachers, or there are not a a lot of Black educators, Mm -hmm. but a lot of times it's like, so how do we, how do you get us there though? How do you, how do you, and where's the recruitment? Yeah. Where's the recruitment? Right. So, and and it's, and everybody says, well, we'll start, well, let's try to start um, as we get to, you know, go to these colleges and, but now you got to start earlier than that. You know what I mean? Because these kids, these, these, these kids, when they look at educators, especially black educators, either they're thinking we are what uh, the custodian or they're just thinking that we're just the we're just the help, right? And so not, not that anything's wrong with that. Nothing, nothing wrong not with that. Not that anything's wrong so, with that because that's gainful employment. However, exactly. you know, but at the end of the day, teaching is not something that can be, you know, because you got kids that are looking at rappers, they're looking at basketball players, they're looking at all these idols of for them. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, these guys are rich and these guys are, you know, they're making all this money. And then they look at teachers like you guys don't make no money. And so, but they don't understand the impact that they can, they can have on someone's life, if they would consider just doing, doing, having a profession like this. And I think that that's why I'm just grateful that I'm able to do that. So, so what are we missing in education um, to make connections? What are we missing in education to draw more men and women of color to the profession outside of those who might regionally be in more heavily populated states or areas with, with people of color, what, yeah. what, what are we, what, how are, how is that connection not being made? Because the students are in the districts. If we have districts at, um, if we have local educational agencies that have 12%, I'm making this number up 12% yeah. African-American population, perhaps there should be mm-hmm. 12% of the teaching. Mm-hmm. staff. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Look like the kids. I don't understand why we won't provide a teaching career so that the students can understand what it takes in order for them to be a teacher. They might like it, right? So I would say I would, I would create a class for, you know, middle school to high school to where the, or I would say more, more so the high school range or career avenue so that these students have an opportunity to get earned credit to understand how to be a teacher. Right. And understand that, understand that avenue and what it takes. But a lot of times, you know, you know, you know, with any profession, you know, they do it for the they do it for nursing profession. You got get the nursing profession in high schools, you got all these other professions in high schools, but you don't have a teaching profession in high school. And then out of all of a sudden, we got our drought of teachers. We don't have enough teachers, but we won't take that, we won't take that information that we're losing teachers and say, let's, let's, why don't we try to create a, a career opportunity for students? I was about to say, you're talking about creating a pathway. A so. pathway, right? A create a pathway. For what students. a thought, what a right? thought, a career pathway for teaching in, in schools. Yeah. Why not? Why wouldn't anyone think of that? You know what I mean? You think of everything else. Someone's done it. Someone's done it. It just hasn't been duplicated. Exactly. Exactly. So it needs to be duplicated. And I think yes. that that will be a, I think that that will be an opportunity for for students that to, to see and see if that's what they're passionate about doing. I would create let kids come in and create lessons in that class, teach their own class, be able to sit in, make PowerPoint, instruct their own class. And just, you know, it could be something that and earn credit and earn credits for it. And then and then kind of take that 
to college, right? Let's collaborate on that and let's do that. Because I, I, I mean, that's, that. that's powerful. Yeah. That is powerful. Because listen, how many people do you know who were athletes in school, maybe including yourself, had a coach that influenced them, came back and became a coach at a school, mm-hmm. right? Came back to be a coach. Mm-hmm. How many people do you know who probably had someone Mom, dad, uncle, somebody who were in in the kitchen, had them in the kitchen cooking and they became Mm -hmm. chefs, right? Mm -hmm. They had someone leading them. Yeah. Where is that same leadership? Where is that same drive or Mm -hmm. connectedness with, you know what? You are great in math, Mm -hmm. telling that to a student. You see students who are awesome in math. You might think about becoming a math teacher. Mm -hmm. Let's put you on this pathway for becoming a math teacher because you yeah. you're an awesome writer you're 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 reading you're you know all this you might consider becoming an English teacher or science yeah. or whatever and and I think a lot of times what what kind of hinders that process and I'm mm-hmm. gonna tell you honestly what could hinder that process is mm-hmm. especially for kids of color and I would say the way that they're treated in schools ah. kind of just the way their experience mm-hmm. with educators right could detour them for even wanting to become an educator, because I didn't want to be an educator, to be honest with you. I wanted to be a dentist because my experience in adolescence was terrible. My teachers were terrible to me. And so I was like, I didn't, I didn't like teachers. I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't care for them. And I know, you know, just being um, an educator and having an opportunity to see some of the experiences that these young um, students have, I can, I can imagine that their career choice would not be education based on some of their experiences, right? So if you had yeah. a good experience, you had a good mentor, you had somebody that knew you, that actually took the time to know who you are, to know what type of student you are, know and and, and get that, coach that out of you yeah. to make sure that they can, look, this is what you need to be. I think this is, you'll, you'll be good at that. I think it's the, I think, I think we'll, we'll have better outcomes. And and you know what? Another thing that was really powerful you said was, you know, being a student who didn't have a good experience. But when people take that and make that the reason why Mm -hmm. they become what they did not receive Mm -hmm. and do it with intention, do it with integrity. Right. And they Mm -hmm. use that as a way of sharing their gifts, because I know what you're experiencing. I don't want you to experience this. So this is how I'm going to teach you. This is how I'm going to educate you. This is how you will learn under my leadership. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. What's missing right now for leaders to be more effective? Um, I would say a seat at the table. Um, well, thank you for coming to the gift table. Yeah, I see. I see that. I, I see that. We got to create it when it's not given to exactly. us, right? Yeah, you got to create it. So, my the thing that I would say is, um, a lot of times, um, you know, people are making decisions based on what they uh, what they think, and they're looking at data, not really what they know, right? And if you had somebody at the table who can kind of share their own perspective on things and and can share their own experiences, because a lot of times you learn from your experiences. And I think that, you know, I think if we have more of that, I think that um, we would have a better understanding of what students and what people need in this in this system. And I think that if we had that that seat at the table, I think that uh, and people under well, I'd have a better understanding of how we we need that help. You know, because if you look at our you know, you look at our babies, we need a lot of help. So they, they do. And I'm, I'm I'm currently reading a book right now where it talks about how there were these societies of African-American leaders who equated education with intellect. Mm -hmm. And just reading about that and and still learning about, you know, these societies they had in, you know, the, the early 19th century, when you think if, if everyone equated your their education with their Mm -hmm. intellect do you know how impactful that would be on people's mindsets Mm -hmm. that how much and not saying that people who don't have formal education or higher education do not have intellect not implying that at all because there are plenty examples of people who have parents grandparents with eighth ninth grade or less education but were the pillars of their family. 
-hmm. but yet they still, whatever those circumstances were, it wasn't that they took education for granted. It was typically because education wasn't always granted to them, Mm -hmm. which is a big difference. But when when we look at how now some of our students, even some of our educators take educating people for granted Mm -hmm. and how that creates that intellectual part and how you read and understand literature and understand math and science. That's a big deal. Exactly. That's a big deal. And that's a different framework of how you have to start positioning um, how we need to start positioning ourselves as educators to Mm -hmm. educate the next generation. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, absolutely correct. Because think about, and I always go back to this. And even when I stop, talk to students or speak to anybody, I'll say, nobody ever thought I was going to go past. I mean, they knew I was going to go to college, but did they ever know that I was going to be Dr. Anthony Rice? No. I mean, that wasn't something that I said when I was a kid. You know, I'm going to be a doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my, my name is going to be Dr. Anthony Rice. No. But my my thing was I just wanted to make sure that um, I put myself in a in a position so that I'm able to um, you know acquire that because I had enough education and I think it was a good thing to have based on the the work that I wanted to do in order to achieve that right and so a lot of times like you said intellectually we we don't really even realize how smart we are sometimes and I think that sometimes that our our I would say lack of confidence, um, our lack of confidence sometimes um, gets in the way because I was never that, con- I was always confident as an athlete, but as a student, I was never that confident. You know, we, we have some really smart intellectual people out there that we don't know about, right? Mm-hmm. We don't know about. And a lot of times the on- in order for us to understand that is that, you know, we have to be really be able to do that, do that work and to understand really what how what we are and how capable we are as a people to do that work. So now you talked about Dr. White and how she was the most to this date, the most influential um, woman for you in education. Mm-hmm. Who have you led or influenced in education that's a woman? Yeah, I've coached a few um a few women and I like uh and um you know some that are administrators now that I've coached that they gone to be administrators and came back and was like, yeah, Dr. Rice, I appreciate everything that you've done for me. And, you know, I, the thing that I wish I could, and I got, there's some males out there as well, but honestly, I wish that I could um, be, I wish that I can make this a, a job to coach, um, consult and coach, um, you know, young, young men and women of color so that they know, understand how to navigate um, the system, the educational system, especially when it comes to when you walk into those, to those, edim, ele, those administrative um, experiences, because mm-hmm. a lot of times the only, the only, our experiences are sometimes the same experiences. And yeah. sometimes we need to talk about it so that we know how to get better and how to do better. Right. And I think the most of the time I wish that, um, you know, I hope that, you know, with, with some of the things that I'm doing now, I hope that that creates an a- a opportunity for me so that I'm able to um, to coach and be of assistance to those that really need that support and, and guidance because it's not easy. You know, you need that you need that person who has that in, that that information and that experience so that you know how to navigate because navigate this this system because it's not it's a, it's a tough one. I can definitely see you doing that, sir. Yeah, so yeah, listen, yeah. you've you've spoken into existence. <laughs> you know, write the plan, get the vision, and make it plain, right? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So looking back, looking back on your career, looking back on where you are now as an amazing and outstanding leader in your own regard, what would you tell yourself now that you didn't know then about being an even more effective leader for others. Dr. Harris, a lot of times I'm very impatient, right? And I like to do things the way that I want to do them. And, and I'm very like, come on, I got to get this done. You know what I mean? And I feel that, you know, if I don't continue to just keep navigating, you know, keep moving forward, it's, I'm going to miss it, right? And I would say, I would say, listen, I would say I, w- I will be more attentive to what's going on around me. And I think that I would listen more. 
right? And I would be a little bit more patient, you know, how we kind of articulate things sometimes, kind of tuning it back in terms of, you know, let me kind of just be a little bit more, a little bit more graceful when yeah. you're having those conversations, right? So I, I would, I would say that just be a little bit more patient, being a little bit more intuitive on everything that's around me. You know, I think those are two things that we all need. Yeah. Patience and grace yeah. for others and for ourselves. Exactly. So I, I appreciate exactly. you sharing that and your reasons why. Exactly. Now, looking ahead, you know, thinking of your next steps, your next moves that may be in the next year, the next two, three, five years. What is it that you need and what is it that you want to be an even more effective leader for yourself and for others? What I need as an edu- edu- as an as an educator is that that people to believe in you and believe that 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 you're capable of impacting families and impacting communities and impacting students and impacting your your staff or whoever that might be, but just having that confidence that that person's going to be able to do that right. And you don't always have to go that that they already know you're going to do it because sometimes we always got to go extra right because you yes. want them to know. That you're you're that you're an outstanding leader, you know what I mean. And sometimes people don't have to do that. People can just walk in and just just kind of just do it, and they're and they're not even doing the work. But at the end of the day, they think they're a good leader. But I want to be somebody where they see like, I know what he's getting ready to do, and just and that's you know that's what I want to do, and that, I mean that's what I need. And I think that I just want somebody just to give me the autonomy. It sounds like you just want someone to trust in you. That's and trust it. in your seat at the exactly, table. Exactly, exactly. Trust in me. Trust exactly, in me. exactly. Can y'all just trust in the man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. That part. That part. Just, that just part. Trust in the man. Just well, trust in the man. I'm, I'm already putting this out in the atmosphere, sir. This is not going to be our first and only conversation here at the gift table. Absolutely not. Because there's so much more we got to talk about. Yeah. But you got to so have me on again. You better have me on again. Oh, we're about okay. to schedule it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so grateful for you being here at the gift table, sharing your gifts, sharing your experience sharing your visions and sharing your passion of why you're a leading man in education. And because of you, sir, I am now calling this segment, the leading man. So <laughs> I appreciate thank that. you for being a leading man. <laughs> Absolutely. And everyone I'm the first. You, I'm the first. You're the first. You're the first leading man and everyone after you. I appreciate you, that. I a appreciate leading man that. as well. All so. Right. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Gifted Table family. Thank you all so much for being here. Don't forget to like this video. You know, you know you like something here. You love something that was said here. So like it. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so that you can get notifications of our weekly postings on Mondays. And as always, remember, stay grounded, innovative, fierce, transparent every day. In other words, stay gifted. I'll see you next time.